All right, we'll turn our attention now to Luke chapter 10. Luke 10, 1 through 16, with a sermon titled, A Harvest Awaits. You know, I grew up in central Illinois, out in the country, to wherever I looked around me was surrounded by cornfields or soybean fields. And you see, the agricultural industry in central Illinois all dictated around the harvest season. You could see the farmers preparing the the ground months in advance, tilling up the ground, softening it, fertilizing it, getting the ground prepared. They plant the seeds, continue to water it and see that it's fertilized and bring it up, and then it's just really a waiting game. And you could see as the, the, the corn began to grow higher and taller to where you couldn't even see through it. It would start to change from a a crisp green to more of a faded brown. And it's coming time. The next week or two, it's time for harvest. Day after day, you'd wake up in the morning. You'd see, it's not time yet, apparently. Which is why I'm not a farmer, right? But it would come that day where you'd wake up, see the sun rise, and already the combine's going. The harvest was just at this specific time, according to the farmer of the fields. And so as we come to our text in Luke chapter 10, a similar imagery is going to await us. That just as the farmer of his field will await until the right appointed time to begin harvesting the yields of his fruits of his labors. So Jesus is going to survey the landscape, the spiritual landscape of the world at the time. And tell that the harvest is now. Here it's reported that 3.37 billion people are still unreached with the gospel or have very minimal gospel presence in their area. It equates to about 7,000 different people groups who have either never heard the name of Jesus Christ or the gospel message with saves or they have very minimal influence in their area. Over 3 billion people. Now, what should that stir up within you as the church? Desires to see that great need met, right? Immediately, when churches hear statistics like this, all of a sudden they are pushed and burdened to begin facing this crisis by identifying individuals within the church, raising them up, equipping them for the task at hand, mobilizing them and sending them out to accomplish this mission. And this truly is a good work to do. It's a virtuous, compelling, and obedient work that we're called to do based out of the Great Commission of Matthew 28. But we have to get the order right in how we approach our mindset towards missions and even evangelism in the world today in our neighborhoods. Because we can be so quick to think that we have everything in our disposal to fix the problem at hand, that we forget to fulfill the very first thing which God calls us to do when approaching a great need in crises like in our text this morning. We're usually quick to act. We're usually quick to respond, to fix issues, to solve it. But what we're usually slow to do is what Jesus says is the first response that should be ours, to pray. To pray to the God of the harvest and then plan and prepare accordingly. But you see, if we want to address this great need, this crisis, and to address the harvest that is just waiting there in the world through evangelism and missions, we must first understand from the Lord of the harvest himself how he wants us to go about his work. Because this is his field. This is his creation. You don't go up to central Illinois and tell a farmer how to plow his field, right? You don't do that. You don't go into God's world and do missions your way. No, you go according to the Lord of the harvest himself. So as we consider Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 16 this morning, we'll come to see that there's such a great need in our world today for gospel missions which must motivate us with such great urgency to take the gospel to the lost around us. We'll see this thread develop throughout 
three headings this morning in the text. The first we find in verses 1 through 2, the call for evangelists. Chapter 10, verse 1 begins, After these things the Lord appointed 70 others also, and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. Then he said to them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. The first we see is the call for evangelists. It's intentional that chapter 10 begins with a call to the faithful disciples around Jesus to really stir them up and give them this green kingdom commission to go out. Because it, it's placed on the backdrop of the end of Luke 9 where you see three individuals who are not willing to do just this. They were hindered. They were taken aback, not willing to count the cost because of the earthly comforts in their life. Or the earthly responsibilities that they had among family or others. And the earthly relationships that they'd cultivated, all these things prevented them from moving forward and following him in this life and preaching the gospel. But now, all of a sudden, in chapter 10, verse 1, Jesus turns to a group of 70, or 72, depending on your translation, to what the previous three individuals weren't willing to do. See, God's going to accomplish his purposes on this earth. The option's up to you if you want to be included in that. Or if you want to be disobedient to the call that he's given for every believer. You see, these 70 individuals were already following Jesus. And this is on top of the 12 apostles Jesus had already appointed. Now these 70 are not apostles, but they're strictly followers of Jesus Christ as disciples. And they were given extraordinary abilities for this specific task because of the extraordinary message that they were going to take to the areas and the cities around them. Ensuring the people through the miraculous healings and teachings, that the kingdom of God, of heaven, has truly come. Now, lots of people get caught up in symbolism and numbers in the Bible. And there are many interesting connections you could make between the 70 and the 72 and the Old Testament, all these different things. But all that's just pure speculation. Because ultimately, it could just very be that Jesus wanted 70. And so he chose 70. These individuals were already following after him. He simply calls them and commissions them as divine messengers on a specific task, a specific mission that he would give them to go, similar to what the disciples were already been sent out to do on their previous missionary journey throughout the past few chapters. But we see now that the number is being expanded of the messengers being sent out. The radius is growing as well. Why? Well, because the time is growing short. The urgency is heightened and greater. Jesus is only on the earth for a limited amount of time now. He is taking steps toward the cross. So he's ensuring that everywhere he would go on that journey, two messengers would be sent before him into every city so that the first time they hear of this Jesus was by the disciples ahead of him so that the king could be announced when he arrived. Now, they're paired up by twos going into these cities. And Deuteronomy 19.15 tells us that two or three were required in order to confirm a matter. And so, therefore, going out in pairs not only strengthened one another and helped protect one another on the dangerous journeys there, but it also would conform to the law's standards as they confirm that the kingdom of God truly has come. In verse 2, we arrive at records such a remarkable statement that should both motivate and fuel every single believer in Jesus Christ to take the gospel to the lost around them. Jesus says this, The harvest truly is great. Meaning, remember, he is the one who can see the hearts. He is all-knowing, so he surveys the entire known world at that time and says the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. So what do you do? You train disciples, you mobilize them, you position them and strategize and go. The time is now, urgency is high. But wait, you miss the first step. And if you miss the first step, the other steps don't matter. Because if God is not in this, nothing will become of it. So he says, therefore, pray. Pray the Lord of the harvest to send out labors into his harvest. 
Why is it that there are so few laborers among them? I mean, chapter 9 was filled with reasons why. There is a high cost for following this Jesus. You would have to deny yourself, take up your cross willingly, and follow after him, setting aside the earthly comforts, the earthly responsibilities, even the earthly relationships of this world, if it calls for it. And so we understand why not many are willing to rise to that cost and follow him. But you see, we can get overly excited and overemphasizing our abilities and our powers and what we can do as human beings in God's great world. That many churches go straight to their own vision of how they would see missions to be done and going about the strategizing ministries. They would send people and all these things are all in the name of the Great Commission, but they don't first pray. And that is the most important step. What happens if we don't pray before going? We're acknowledging with our actions that we are enough of a task. That I possess everything sufficient to do this spiritual work. Does that not sound familiar to chapter 9? The disciples thought the same thing and they failed to remove this demon from this young boy. See, all these steps of strategizing and mobilizing, training, all those things are good. But they all must be set on the foundation of prayer to the Lord of the harvest. Otherwise, the foundation will fall beneath. So the first step is to pray. And you say, okay, yeah, I got it, right? I know we're supposed to pray. But then what? No, you missed it if you think that. You've missed it completely. You're still indicating that you think that mankind is enough to do this spiritual work. Dear ones, God is the only one who can do any sort of spiritual work in us. But he uses us to complete that. But only as we're dependent on him. See, we must go to the Lord of the harvest, we must go to the head farmer to see how he would have his field to be plowed, how to be harvested, how to be prepared, how to be cultivated. So we have to understand through the scriptures. And the first thing, when he calls these evangelists, and spoiler alert, these aren't just evangelists, these are just Christians. These are faithful believers who are called to take the gospel to where he would tell them to go. But you see, prayer is the responsibility of every Christian regarding missions. See, not everyone is intended and meant to go overseas. We talked about that, right? Not everyone's meant to sell everything they have, uproot their lives, and go overseas for gospel missions. But every single believer is called to pray for missions, to pray for the gospel, to go forth in their neighborhoods, in their cities, in their states, their countries, in the entire world, and Everyone may not be called to move your entire family. But God has placed you exactly where he wants you so that you would evangelize those around you. Within your families, within your neighborhoods, your office, your schools, wherever you find yourselves. But what must we do first? We must pray. We must pray for God's help, for his guidance, for his discernment, for him to bring people across our paths with softened hearts to be receptive to the truth of God's word and then follow after Paul's model and pray for boldness to take advantage of those opportunities when they do come. But before we get busy with strategizing and mobilizing and moving, first comes prayer. For God to raise up his work. For God to raise up his leaders, his faithful followers. But next, if you're truly praying for God to raise up individuals to meet the need of the gospel in the world around them, you have to be ready to be the answer to your own prayer. You have to be ready to go yourself. It may not be overseas, but it may be the cubicle across from you to the person you've known for 20 years and you've never shared the gospel with them once. Be prepared to answer your own prayer to go to your next door neighbor. 
and to bring them, invite them into your home, to build a relationship, to give them the gospel truth. This is where the next section of our text comes. Those who God calls to pray first for evangelists, then he commissions them to go and meet the need they just prayed for. Look at verses 3 through 9, the commission of evangelists. Verse 3, go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves, carry neither money bag, knapsack, nor sandals, and greet no one along the road. But whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. If not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you and heal the sick there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. So after he first calls the disciples and these evangelists together, he calls them and tells them to pray. And then he commissions them, now that you've prayed, now go. For they are the answers to the prayers of others to take the gospel to the world around them. It's not optional for them. They are being commissioned to obedient as evangelists to take the news of the kingdom of God to those who are lost around them. And Jesus provides throughout verses 3 through 9 many important qualifications for their work. They don't just do whatever they want. There are specific guidelines in which they must operate. He was first gives them a description. He's sending them out as lambs in the midst of wolves, which means that they would face hostility. They would face spiritual warfare along the way. Remember, Satan still has his outposts in play here in this text, just as he still has his outposts in play in our world today. He's against any such spread of the gospel, for he he wants his kingdom to stay intact as long as possible before he knows his own destruction and demise is coming. So the disciples were sent out as lambs in the midst of wolves. So what should they bring? Lots of stuff, right? Right? to protect themselves, to prepare for any such encounter they might have. No, this sounds familiar, right? Just take what you got. You don't need any more supplies, for he will provide everything along the way. But Jesus also tells them to not greet anyone along the way. Seems a little bit different. Seems a little cold and harsh in our context, but... We have to go back into their time period and culture to understand that. Many greetings were drawn out, would include many hours together, meals, maybe even stays at days on end, especially if they're family members that you come across in the cities. It could take even weeks. So Jesus is really telling them that there's no time for delays here. The utmost urgency is required in this kingdom mission. But you see, someone who is in such an urgent mission would be excused from the customary greetings of this day. But you, you kind of know what this is like, right? You know there's certain individuals that if you get caught up in conversation, you're banking at least an hour, right? And if you're in a hurry somewhere, you might just like, I need to slip out so as to not get preoccupied. It's not, you don't want to be mean or rude, but you, you have somewhere you need to get to. There's urgency that's there. And such as we see here, Jesus says, keep your head down, stay focused on the task at hand, which also would prevent them from taking maybe a detour to go visit family members, right? Turn this into sort of a little bit of a vacation, a work vacation type of thing. No. The mission is simple. The task at hand is most urgent. No delays can be had. And the rest of the text says that they're supposed to be content with the lodging and accommodations which are provided for them. Find one place in each city and stay there. Eat whatever food they have. If you hear down the street that they're making this awesome meal, the food's better at Susan's house down the street. I'm going to just hop over there for the rest of my stay, right? No, none of that. Stay focused. Be content. God will provide what you need. It may not be what you'd like, but it's what you need. And so it's to forsake any sort of additional earthly comforts that they would have there. Because you see, what must distinguish themselves as disciples and followers of this kingdom whose entrance is now available to sinners was they were to distinguish themselves from traveling itinerant teachers of the day who they were not to look for extravagant, luxurious accommodations to comfort themselves because the message they were giving was regarding the nearness of their eternal kingdom. 
But you see, nothing minimizes the urgency of the kingdom message like getting comfortable in the kingdom of this world. Nothing reduces the urgency that this life is but a vapor and a breath and eternity is coming. Sins will be paid for, but there is a gospel that saves and it's extended to all. Nothing reduces that urgency to nothing as comfort. And we saw this last week, did we not? The first one, the earthly comforts, they can be both a blessing, but if abused, it can be one of the greatest hindrances to obedience to the gospel. Because in the name of comfort, we are willing to sin and neglect obedience and evangelism. In the name of comfort, we grow lazy, sluggish, really by our actions, revealing that the kingdom of God really isn't that urgent. We're good where we're at. So Jesus says, do not delay. Don't look for these earthly comforts. Stay on task. The mission demands it. But verse 9 gets the heart of what they were commissioned to actually do. They're to spread the news that the kingdom of God is at hand. Because the king is at hand and he would arrive shortly. To show that these were no ordinary messengers, Jesus gave them this specific ability. Not just to preach the gospel with such clarity, but the power to demonstrate that this kingdom is not of this earth, but of heaven, of the creator of heaven and earth. So they were commissioned not just to preach this message, but to heal those around them to show that they serve an all-powerful king who is calling them to repentance. But you see, these instructions really reveal that God's messengers, they must conduct themselves with the fullness of integrity and character to stay on task in the mission so that they wouldn't diminish or contradict the message that they give. Which is such a good reminder because every true believer in Jesus Christ is a messenger, is an ambassador of Jesus Christ. You represent Jesus Christ on this earth. And we too are called to take the gospel to those around us. But how you conduct yourself along this journey will either validate or undermine your message. Because if you say your home is heaven, but you're so comfortable and at ease in this world, then it prevents this contradicting picture to others because you look like you're already home here on this earth. You see, the call has been made for these disciples to rise up and take this commission for evangelism seriously. They've been given specific instructions on how they are to conduct themselves and what they are to do and what they are to bring or not bring. But Jesus next is going to give them very explicit clarification. Do not expect everyone to receive this message. In fact, many will reject it. But when rejecting comes, you have to understand, disciples, but they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. And if they're rejecting me, they're rejecting the Father. Let's look now at verses 10 through 16, the condemnation for rejection. We've seen the call, we've seen the commission of evangelists. Now we see the condemnation for the response to the message. Verse 10, but whatever city you enter, and they say, do not receive you, Go out into the streets and say, the very dust of your city which clings to us, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near to you. But say to you that it will be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. He who hears you, hears me. He who rejects you, rejects me. And he who rejects me, rejects him who sent me. They're to go and to face rejection just as Jesus had commanded the apostles to go before him. When you meet rejection of somebody in the city, 
You're not to respond in hostility, <laughs> James and John, calling down fire on Samaria. What do you do? Shake off the dust from your feet, off of your jacket, as a very indictment of condemnation of the dust of the ground for that city because of their rejection of the message and ultimately the God who sent the message. But why is it that these cities are condemned? Verse 11 says, because the kingdom of God has come near to them. How is this so? What tangible evidence do we have? Because the kingdom of God is present wherever the king and his citizens are present, spreading the kingdom message of the gospel. But don't miss what he says next in verse 12. It's a shocking statement. One that many readers of scripture overlook or misunderstand. He says it will be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. I mean, if your Old Testament knowledge is somewhat up to par, you, you, the sirens are going off. Sodom is the pinnacle of sin and wickedness in the entire Old Testament. I mean, God had judged Sodom and Gomorrah in such dramatic ways, totally annihilating the entire city. How is it that there is a greater rejection and punishment of these cities than the wickedness of Sodom? Well, don't miss what verse 12 is teaching. Verse 12 is teaching with clarity that there are degrees of punishment in hell based on the exposure to the light of the gospel while here on earth. Hebrews 10, 29 affirms this. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? Counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace. You get a picture of this illustrated in Luke 12, 47 through 48. And that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not know yet committed things deserving of stripes shall be beaten with few. So for everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. And to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. The Bible is clear. The New Testament explicitly teaches that there are degrees of torment and punishment for suffering in hell, and it's all based on the exposure to the light of the gospel in this life. The more you know and are told of the gospel, the more you are held accountable for what you have heard and how you respond to it. And if you don't believe it, Jesus gives some example cities in verses 13 through 15. He says it's going to be worse for Chorazin and Bethsaida than for Tyre and Sidon. You see, Chorazin and Bethsaida were villages in Galilee with a significant Jewish presence. I mean, Bethsaida itself was the hometown of Andrew and Peter and Philip. You'd think that a town or a city that produced some of the disciples would be elevated and blessed because of it. But on the contrary... Many great miracles were done in these cities, yet were met with rejection and unbelief. But if you go back to the Old Testament and understand from Tyre and Sidon, these were Gentile cities north of Galilee, and really these represent the pinnacle of idol worship and evil in the Old Testament. I mean, Ezekiel himself pronounced judgment against him, but Jesus says that even the same miracles that were performed in Chorazin and Bethsaida if they were performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented in sackcloth and ashes. Meaning, the exposure, the greater exposure to the truth of the gospel, which Chorazin and Bethsaida had, means they are held more accountable for their greater rejection. The greater the knowledge of truth and the greater rejection means the greater the condemnation and punishment. But they aren't the only ones. Capernaum will also be condemned as well. Verse 15 says, Capernaum's self-righteousness seems like it raised them to even heaven on earth. As we've studied throughout the Gospel of Luke, we've found Jesus a lot in Capernaum. Capernaum was really the unofficial headquarters of Jesus' ministry. Many miracles, much of his ministry were done there, but was largely met with unbelief and rejection. And they'll be held accountable for that. 
One writer describes it this way, that this teaches us that all will be judged according to their spiritual life. And that from those who have enjoyed most religious privileges, most will be required. They teach us the exceeding hardness and unbelief of the human heart. It was possible to hear Christ preach and to see Christ's miracles and yet to remain unconverted. Which really leaves us with some of the most important considerations from the text this morning. The first of which is that you will be held accountable for the truth of the gospel that you hear in this life. Do not misunderstand. There is no neutral response to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It either softens or it hardens. It was Spurgeon who said this, the same sun which melts wax hardens clay. And the same gospel which melts some persons to repentance hardens others in their sins. You either hear the gospel of Jesus Christ that you are a sinner in need of saving and you respond to that in repentance and acknowledgement and confession of your sin. Truly acknowledging that you are not enough to save yourself. And therefore you cry out to a merciful and holy God to save you. And by his mercy, according to the obedient life of Jesus and the sacrificial death in the sinner's place, you can be forgiven. You can be set free. Your soul can be saved. The slate of sin can be wiped clean by the blood of the Lamb, given the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ, which he had earned. But that same gospel, which could bring you to repentance, if you suppress it, if you push it off, if you reject it yet again, it will only further harden and callous your heart and heap up more and more condemnation and punishment on that final day. It's a sobering reality that we will be held accountable for the gospel message which you have heard. For everyone who hears it and suppresses it and rejects it time and time again, and it's here where my heart truly goes out to those young ones who are raised in the church. To these most wonderful Christian privileges of being in a godly Christian family who brings you to church and teaches you the truth. And yet if you, young children, if you think that only by associating with mom and dad's faith, that because your parents are Christians, that that's enough to get you into heaven, or because you go to church or a Christian school, that that's enough in God's eyes. You are deceived and you are misled. Every person will stand before God's throne individually, not as a family unit. So young ones, hear me as your pastor in love to you. It is such a privilege to be here at church. It's a joy to be here. But we must take it seriously. We must respond well to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Jesus even welcomes in children to his heavenly family. You don't have to get to a certain old age. The the simple childlike faith, he says. Dependence and trust on Jesus. That he can save you. But hear me, I've seen it for far too long. Uh, While you might be softened while you're younger, as the years go on, if you don't truly repent and trust in Jesus Christ, this same gospel just becomes more commonplace. To where many adults even walk away from the faith or leave the church. Not just saying this church, but the church at large. What does that indicate? First John says they were never of us. They were pretenders. They were what we call make-believers. They know the songs, they know the verses, they can recite them to you. But you see, it truly matters the condition of your heart and its receptivity to God's word. Do not minimize it. Do not justify sin in your life, no matter what. So really, take the examples of the cities in the text this morning. 
No more pretending. No more games. No more playing the part of the Christian, just maybe to please mom and dad. Kids, your parents want to know truly where you're at because they love you. They want to help you. Your church loves you and wants to help you with this. You don't need to pretend. But you do need to humble yourself and respond to the gospel in knowing that you are a sinner and asking Jesus to save you by his mercy, by his grace. And we know with confidence when you do that, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It is a promise. There's no ifs. There's no ands or buts about it. There's only one name under heaven by which mankind can be saved, and it's Jesus Christ and him alone. You are not good enough in and of yourself. No one outside of Jesus Christ is, and that's because if we're included in union with him, we can be good enough because he was good enough. And that's the only way. So may today be the day of salvation for you. Don't put this off anymore because there's a time where you will not be as receptive as you are right now. If you suppress it, you're forming another layer of callous over your heart, further walking into this judgment in the future. But you see, if you've responded in repentance and faith to the gospel, you have to understand that once you're saved, you are now in the family of God. Your sins are forgiven. You have all the inheritance and blessings and riches of Jesus Christ, which he has earned. But the work has just begun. Because we are able now to join in the ranks of Christ to evangelize this lost and dying world. There's no such thing as being saved and then sitting on the sidelines. In fact, those who think they're saved and they're sitting on the sidelines, there's really one category for a believer who's not evangelizing and it's in, they're in sin. They're being disobedient. And so we have to understand, secondly, for those of you who truly believe, the Great Commission is extended to every single believer here today. Yeah, the text of Luke 10, the commission of the 70, was limited specifically to those in the text, but the Great Commission of Matthew 28 is extended to the 70 times 7, meaning everyone. Hear the words, the familiar but powerful words of Jesus in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, but the commission does not end there. There are far too many who, for the sake of the gospel, will abandon all of the rest of what Jesus has taught them. But you cannot reject the second half of the commission in the name of the first one. So much in the name of evangelism has forsaken the doctrines of the truth of God's word that we just need to get them saved. But the ultimate goal of this, the ultimate goal of God is not to save sinners, but to glorify his great name. And that's why we're here on this earth. That is what we are called to do. It's not enough. It's not enough to get him saved. In our man-centeredness, selfishness, we think that's the goal. But what glory is there to a God who saves you? for you to just turn your back on his word and live however you want to. There's no glory in that. We must remember the ultimate goal of God, and it is his glory. Everything else in this life, even the salvation of sinners, falls underneath bringing God glory, not ourselves. You have to see there's a parallel between the go in our text of verse 3 and the go command in Matthew 28, 19. Just as these disciples were called to take the message of the gospel and go and take it with them, so we're called to take the message of the gospel, which really we have a more complete message because we're on this side of the cross, knowing the fullness of the revelation of Jesus Christ, not just that he brings life, but that he would give of himself on that cross, that he would not stay dead, but it would prove that the wrath of God had been satisfied and he would send back to the Father on high, showing that it is complete and it is finished. 
We have the fullness of it. We actually have more of the message than the disciples did at this time. What we don't have, though, is the ability to heal others. And honestly, that's okay. But you see, as we really take this serious, of the call for evangelism, it's met by fear with many. There's hesitations. I don't think I need to persuade you that this is a command. Everyone knows that. But what keeps you from obeying the command is this area of fear of man and hesitancy in it. But you have to understand this, that if they rejected Christ's message, then they might reject, and some will, reject yours as well. But when they do that, they're not rejecting you, but they're rejecting him. And ultimately what this leads to is it's not about your persuasiveness, it's not about your giftedness and abilities as an evangelist, because you will find none more gifted than the Son of God as a preacher, an evangelist, and even he was rejected. The issue lies with the heart of man. Mankind loves to worship himself. Mankind will not bow the knee to anyone else other than self. So when rejection happens, take comfort from verse 16. He who hears you, hears me. He who rejects you, rejects me. And he who rejects me, rejects him who sent me. If they reject the gospel, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting him. They're not rejecting your message, but his message. They aren't just rejecting you, they're rejecting the Christ who has commissioned you and the Father who commissioned the Christ to come. It's ultimately an attack and offense against God. You're simply a messenger. Your task is simple. To take that message to a lost world around you. You see, as long as you are faithful to dispense and deliver the message of the gospel, you're found faithful and therefore successful no matter the response. Because we have to remind ourselves success is not determined by the response to the message. If that's the case, then Jesus himself is a failure. Many rejected him. No, success is determined purely by obedience to Christ, who says to go and make disciples of all the nations. You know, there's many, many churches in the country and in the world who will put together these evangelistic campaigns and programs and partnerships all in the name of evangelism. And it's not that those things are bad at all. But as you read throughout the New Testament, you know what God's program is for evangelism in this world is? It's you. It's faithful believers rubbing shoulders with unbelievers in this lost and dying world. You are the program. You're not plan B or C as if other things didn't work. No. The partnership that God has enlisted us in is his plan A. And it will work because God never fails. So really, it really brings to mind Isaiah 6. Where we get this picture of the, of the throne room and of God saying to Isaiah, who, who shall I send? Who is it that will go on behalf of us? And you get in Isaiah 6, Isaiah, hear my Lord, send me. Question to you, who will go to your families? Who will take the gospel to your work? Who will go into your gated communities? Who will go into your neighborhoods? Who will go into your schools? Who's here to say, here am I, Lord, send me? Because that is is the call of every disciple. There is no other alternative. There is obedience or there is disobedience. So what do we do? Step number one is clear. We must pray to God to send more laborers into the fields because the harvest is plenty. But be prepared to answer your own prayer by taking the gospel to the people God's already placed around you. They are the field. You're already there. He doesn't need to send you. He's already sent you. Will you be faithful simply to obey? Not to convert the masses. 
The responses are left to God. Are you faithful to be a messenger? And we don't water down the message. Galatians 1. It's only one gospel that saves. And we need to make sure we dispense it with faithfulness so that we would be found faithful. But ultimately, even above that, God would receive the most glory. Let's pray. God, it's a difficult text to grapple with because it confronts us with our human comforts and securities. Lord, I do pray that you would forgive us for our selfishness. Forgive us for our laziness. Forgive us for our complacency of finding too much of our comforts here in this world. Lord, I do pray that you would raise up more faithful laborers of the gospel that you would raise them up from this very church. Future pastors, future missionaries, just future faithful disciples who are willing to step out in faith and obedience to you to evangelize where you've placed them. Lord, I do pray that you would provide many opportunities and conversations before us in the context of our lives. And Father, when those times happen, I do pray that you would give us the boldness that even Paul asked for, to not shrink back in the fear of man in the midst of these divine opportunities you've given us. But Lord, that we might be found faithful, that we might be found successful and pleasing before you, leaving the results to you. But we do pray that you would save many sinners through our efforts in the coming years. Not for our sakes, not even for their sakes, but for your glory. Father, help us to apply this word in truth, not just being a hearer this morning, but doers. We pray this in the sufficient name of Jesus. Amen.